Welcome back. In this video, I'll show how to handle return values from functions, pass parameters to functions, and interact with external code. So let's take a look at what happens to the stack when you call a function. Here we have some example code on the left, and a visual representation of the stack, as well as the state of a few registers on the right. We're starting with an empty stack, so ESP is the value of the highest address. Remember that the stack grows downward in value with each push. I've started with EBP set to 123, just to help keep track of where it is uh, in this example. The first instruction after our entry point is the push 21, which leaves the stack looking like this. Remember that push moves the stack pointer and then writes the value to the new address. This will be the argument we're passing to the function. That's right, arguments in x86 get passed on the stack. Next is this call times two instruction, which pushes a return address to the stack and then jumps uh, to the code at the times two label. The first instruction after the times two label is push EBP. Remember that this is used to preserve the old base pointer in case any other code was using it. In this case, it's not necessary, but it's still a good habit to start your functions this way. Next, we move the value of ESP, which is 20 in this example, into EBP. This is to preserve the current top of the stack. That should be familiar uh, from the last video. It's the prologue of the function. Now we move the value stored at the address of EBP plus eight. This gives us access to the argument that was passed to the function, which in this case is the value 21. If we had passed more arguments to the function, they would all follow after this EBP plus eight address. So if you're pushing all 32 bit integers as arguments to the function, they're all gonna be after EBP plus eight in steps of four bytes. So plus eight and then plus four and then plus four is how you'll access all the arguments that are passed. Next, we'll add EAX to itself since the purpose of this function is to multiply the argument by two. And then we can begin the function epilogue by restoring the stack pointer from EBP. In this example, this is unnecessary because our function doesn't use the stack. But if we had allocated any variables or pushed anything to the stack, it would have the effect of undoing those changes to the stack pointer. Now we pop off the value of EBP that was stored in the prologue and then execute the return instruction which pops off the return address and jumps there. Now, at this point, the return value of our function is stored in the EAX register. But I'd like to use that as the exit status for the program, so I'm moving the value of EAX into EBX, and then moving one into EAX to specify that I'm about to make a system exit call and then performing the actual interrupt, which exits the program with the exit status of 42, because we just moved that into EBX. And there you have it. Times two is a function that takes an integer argument and returns that value times two. This is really all there is to writing functions in x86. Arguments are passed on the stack right before the call instruction and the return value is passed in the EAX register. Not only do you know how to write functions now, you also know how to call them. And this means that we can start using functions from other programs in our assembly code. Allow me to demonstrate. In this example, I'll write a program that uses the printf function from C. And to make that simple, I'll use GCC as the linker instead of the LD program, like I've been doing. One interesting point uh, to make here is that C defines the underscore start entry point for you, and then expects your code to provide a label main function. 
If you've programmed in C, that should be familiar. So the first thing we'll do is export this main label to tell GCC where our main function is. Next, uh, since we want to use the printf function, we'll need to tell NASM that we expect this to be an external symbol. And that's all this line does. Then I'm creating a dot data section to hold the format string that I want to call printf with. In this case, the format string has one format specifier that expects an integer. Again, if you're familiar with C, this should make sense. If not, just know that the percent sign %i portion of the string will be replaced by an integer that we pass to printf. You'll notice that there are two bytes following the string itself. The first is 0x, 0a, and that's how you denote the hex value 0a, uh, which is 10 in hexadecimal. And this is the code for the new line character. This is to make it so that in the terminal, the line after we print our string doesn't happen on the same line. A new line happens, so it starts on the next line. The second byte is 0x00, which is 0 in hex. This is to tell C where the end of the string is. Since strings are just sequences of bytes, functions like printf have no way of knowing where they end. So you have to make sure to end every string like this with a zero byte. This typically is referred to as the null terminator. Then we can create the label for our main function. Add a prolog, you should be familiar with this, Finally, we get to our function call. This is done by pushing our two arguments onto the stack and then calling printf. The arguments are pushed in reverse order. So in this example, we're calling printf with the message string as the first argument and the integer 123 as the second argument. Next, we can move 0 into eax as the return value for our main function. This will be the exit status of our program. Uh, and remember that zero means that everything ran correctly. Then add an epilogue to restore the stack and return control to C, and the program is complete. Now we can assemble it like usual, but when it comes time to link it, we use GCC, just because it's easier to include the C standard library and everything. I'm passing the M32 flag here because this is 32-bit assembly. After this series, I might do some videos on 64-bit assembly, but this series is specifically for 32-bit code. And if we execute the program, it says testing123 dot dot dot. Pretty cool. Now you know how to interact with C from assembly. There's one more important detail that I glossed over in this video, which is that since the caller pushes the arguments onto the stack, it's also their responsibility to remove the arguments from the stack when the call is done. None of the examples here were complex enough to need that, but be aware that the call instruction won't do this for you. And if you make too many calls without popping them, you can grow the stack quite a bit, which will use up more memory than is needed. Well, that's it for this video. In the next one, I'll flip this around and show how to build functions for C using assembly. Bye.